Um, salam. Good. How are you? So last time I actually I attend the you know the class and then um, I I order those. Yeah, this is for the tasabi. I order like a lot of them. So I'm sure this one I can ask people if they want to take what they want to take. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So what do you want? What do you are you gonna be here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you keep them and I'll tell everyone to come get it from you. Sure. Uh, yeah, outside is good. Okay. I'll, I'll tell everyone on the table here. I'll tell everyone to get it. Zakallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala man bu'itha rahmatan lil alameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We thank and praise Allah, the Almighty. We beseech him to shower Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with salutations and compliments, peace, mercy and blessings. Allahumma alimna ma yunfa'una wa anfa'na bima alimtana wa zidna ilma. We ask Allah to teach us that which benefits us and we ask Allah to allow us to benefit from what he has taught us, and we ask Allah to increase us in beneficial knowledge. Amma ba'd, as to what follows, welcome to another Friday night. Um, Alhamdulillah, for those of you that were here, uh, I hope you all had an enjoyable Eid with your families, and with your friends. Um, do we have anyone here that made Hajj this year? Anyone? Okay, inshaAllah. Inshaallah ta'ala soon. Um, how was my Hajj? It was wonderful, alhamdulillah. It was really, really nice, alhamdulillah. And, um, and I really hope and pray, inshallah ta'ala, that, um, that you all will be able to uh, uh, go, inshallah, soon, sooner than later. And uh, hopefully if I can be part of that experience and make it enjoyable for you, that would be a big um, blessing and pleasure for me, inshallah ta'ala. So, um, anybody here make Hajj already? Who has done Hajj? MashaAllah, good number. Alhamdulillah. Um, so if you have not, uh, you know earlier today after Jumu'ah, I was sitting down with four brothers after Jumu'ah. We were sitting here in the Musalla. We were myself and there were four people. Two of them, I had the pleasure of being in their company in Hajj. One of them this year and the other one two years ago. And then the other brother, the third one, he had made Hajj in 1997, long time ago. And then the fourth brother all the way here, he hadn't made Hajj. So we're sitting down and we're all going through our memories. And so I told that the brother who had not made Hajj, I said, Inshallah, I think if you make the sincere intention to go for Hajj next year, you'll be able to. And he said, no, I don't think I can go next year. I said, um, why not? And he's like, no, I don't think next year, but inshallah, I think the year after. So I said to him, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good friend of mine. So I said, why? Why are you planning that? Why don't you just plan for next year? And he said, no, no, I'm not going to be able to afford it next year. But I, you know, according to my plan, the year after that, I'll be able to afford it inshallah. So I thought about that for a second. So I asked the other brothers who were sitting there, I said, which one came first? Your intention to go for Hajj or your ability to afford it? Which one? 
And they all said, you know, um, they all said in that gathering, maybe some people have a different experience, but they said, we wanted to go for Hajj and we decided, inshallah, this year we're going for Hajj. And at that time, when we made that decision, we could not afford it. But once we made that intention and then we took the necessary steps and we were constantly thinking about it throughout the whole year, it worked out. If you were to ask me at that time when I first made the intention to go for Hajj, how you're going to do it, I don't know. But I made that intention and I put in some effort and the success was from Allah. And it worked out. Uh, and uh, that's not uncommon by the way. I've heard that from so many people. Maybe some of you have experienced that. I've heard that from a lot of people. So, um, inshallah, never, nothing is difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make possible. So, if it might be difficult for you, that's fine. We go through difficulty, then put it in the hands of Allah and make the intention and see what happens. And then let us know about it so we can be happy. Tayyib, let us continue with our topic. We have been discussing the asbab the ways that we can earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we are going through a list of 10 that uh, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim uh, collected in one of his um, publications. And so far we mentioned three. We didn't finish the third. We're almost done. Um, so can anybody remember? For those of you that have attended in the past, what were they? Yes. So the first one was Qira'atul Qur'ani bit tadabbur to read and recite the Qur'an with contemplation, with active reading, asking questions and seeking lessons and morals and benefits and seeking how it can be relevant uh, to me. And the second, somebody else? Yes. Good. Coming close to Allah with voluntary acts of worship after completing the obligatory acts. At-taqarrub ila Allahi bin nawafil بعد الفرائض good and the third yes دوام ذكره على كل حال continuously and consistently making ذكر of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all uh, different circumstances and situations and actually that's the one that we were still on we talked about um, different examples of ذكر and if I'm not mistaken it's been a little bit of a while we talked about um La ilaha illallah, some of the virtues of that. And we also mentioned the virtue of um, making sure that we do some dhikr in a majlis, that we don't conclude any gathering that we are in, except that we make some mention of Allah or His Messenger, to make sure that that gathering, that that majlis is recorded for us in our book of good deeds and not something that we will regret. Uh, inshallah, I think that's where we uh, stopped. I have a couple of different marks in the book, so I think that's the one we stopped at. And the next, uh, and the last section of this chapter is a uh, discussion of another form of dhikr. And we said in the beginning that actually reciting Qur'an is a form of dhikr. Salah is a form of dhikr. La ilaha illallah is a form of dhikr. We talked about dhikr with the tongue. We also talked about tafakkur, contemplating and uh, thinking about Allah and uh, observing the beauty of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thinking about the majesty and might of Allah. And another great form of dhikr of remembrance is As-salatu ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, Sending salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And actually, this is uh, one of the most virtuous forms of dhikr uh, and, uh, and most praiseworthy And it's closely related to the personality and the individual the Prophet ﷺ being someone who is highly praised. Actually, Allah said in the Quran, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Sharh, um, verse number four, you know, أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ وَضَعْنَا عَنْكَ وِزْرَكَ Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ And we have elevated your mention. Meaning the mention of the Prophet ﷺ is something virtuous. It is something of a high status. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ is one who is praised and one who is always remembered for his uh, positive and good and beautiful traits and attributes and accomplishments and sacrifices. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu he is always, his dhikr, his mention and remembering of the Prophet Sallallahu is always something praiseworthy and lofty and virtuous. Uh, and that's why sending salat and salam upon him, sending salutations upon the Prophet Sallallahu is uh, a byproduct of that, is also a very virtuous uh, form of dhikr. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran commanded the malaika after he himself began Allah the Most High began with something, then He commanded the angels and then He commanded us as humans, as believers here on the earth to follow suit. And that is to send salutations. It's actually a command from Allah. In Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse 56, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allah says that definitely Allah and His angels, they send salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ, upon the Messenger, upon the Prophet, and Nabi. Allah then says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, that's us, Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Send salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ. Now this commandment uh, is actually very interesting. Um, Imam Ibn Kathir says in his tafsir, he says, المقصود من الآية أن الله سبحانه أخبر عباده بمنزلة عبده ونبيه عنده في الملأ الأعلى بأنه يثني عليه عند الملائكة المقربين وأن الملائكة تصلي عليه. Allah, Imam Al Kathir says that the the one of the objectives of this verse is Allah wants to inform us that He is making mention of the Prophet ﷺ with the angels that are close to him. And this is happening in the heavens, above the earth that we are dwelling in. And the angels are following suit. So this shows us the status of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why one of the scholars says that Amarallahu Ta'ala Ahl al-Alam As-Sufla bi-salati wa taslimi alayhi liyajtami'a thana'u alayhi min Ahl al-Alamin Al-Ulwi wa Sufli, Jami'an. Allah commanded us as believers to send salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ, just as the angels are doing so, so that the praise and the mention of the Prophet Muhammad is done in the heavens and on earth. The dwellers of the heavens are making mention of the Prophet, sending salutations, and the dwellers of the earth are doing so. So his mention is elevated between the heavens and the earth in all levels and stations. And that's really beautiful. What does Salat and Salam upon the Prophet literally mean? The meaning of it is فَصَلَاتُ اللَّهِ عَلَى نَبِيهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ تَعْنِي ثَنَاؤُهُ سُبْحَانَهُ عَلَيْهِ عِنْدَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَهُ So when Allah says Salah, the, the word here that is used for, which is Salah, what is meant here is thana is praise. Praise of the Prophet Muhammad in front of the angels. Allah is praising Muhammad وسلم, in front of the angels and also it includes rahmah, mercy of Allah upon his messenger Muhammad That's with regards to Allah. With regards to the angels, وَأَنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ فَصَلَاةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى نَبِيهِ ثَنَاؤُهُ أَمَّا صَلَاةُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ عَلَيْهِ فَمَعْنَاهَا الدُّعَاءَ لَهُ بِالْبَرَكَةِ وَالْمَغْفِرَةِ and the angels, when they do Salat and Salam, that is dua. The angels are making dua for the Prophet. They are supplicating, they are praying for the Prophet Muhammad. For his um, barakah, blessings, for him to be blessed, and everything involving the Messenger of Allah to be blessed, and for his maghfirah, and for forgiveness. And so when we do that, we are doing salutations, compliments and we are asking Allah to uh, bring down his divine blessings and mercy upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and actually that is a manifestation of something Allah already promised for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's why after we hear the adhan after we hear the adhan we say that the prayer that we are taught to say after the adhan uh, it's it's a long dua um, but of it, one part of it is Ati Muhammadan al-wasilata wal-fadila 
وبعثه المقام المحمود الذي وعدتك as it comes in some narrations and other narrations that last phrase is not mentioned so grant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this station uh, which is a high station one that he will have on the day of judgment when all the creation will be gathered the Prophet sallallahu alayhi will have the closest station to Allah and to his throne that Allah promised that Allah promised that station and guaranteed it for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that station is something reserved for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so actually his praise is something that Allah already promised and guaranteed and us doing so serves many purposes of it is to give him his right in terms of mention and praise and of it also is to remind us of his value and his importance in our lives if you love someone a lot you will be making mention of them a lot that's just how it goes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Ali Imran قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ the messenger is commanded to say to the people if you truly love Allah if you are truthful in your claim that you love Allah then follow me meaning follow the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam the result of which is yuhibbukum Allah Allah will love you and aren't we talking about how to attain the love of Allah yes so one of the ways to attain the love of Allah is this specific form of dhikr is to Continuously send salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah will love you and وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ And Allah will forgive you. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ And Allah is the most forgiving, most merciful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in a hadith, مَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيَّ صَلَاةً وَاحِدًا صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهَا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَشْرَ صَلَوَاتٍ وَحُطَّتْ عَنْهُ عَشْرَ خَطِئَاتٍ Mahdi, can you do us a favor and ask the brothers there to turn on the AC in the room? Jazakallah khairan. ورفعت له عشر درجات. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says whoever sends one salutation upon me, Allah will make mention of them and will send compliments and salutations upon them tenfold, ten times. So you are getting back what you are doing times ten from Allah. And on top of that, you will be relieved of ten sins and ten mistakes, ten poor choices that are on our record that will be removed from our record. وَرُفِعَتْ لَهُ عَشْرَ دَرَجَاتِ And we will be elevated in our status ten levels. As you know, people are on different levels. People are on different levels in this dunya and definitely in the akhirah, people will be on different levels. As we stand in the Day of Judgment awaiting account, people will be on different levels. Once we are entered into Jannah, people are on different levels. Even in the hellfire, نَعِيَذُ بِاللَّهِ May Allah protect us uh, from uh, ever having any experience with the hellfire, even the hellfire is of different levels. So this is how it, there are different stations and different levels based on a person's deeds, based on a person's choices and actions. And so this is one of the uh, uh, acts of worship, one of the adhkar uh, that earns the mention of Allah ten times, that relieves us, uh, uh, relieves us from our record of ten sins and mistakes and also elevates us in our status ten levels. <coughs> that is an authentic hadith recorded in the book of Muslim. We find in the book of At-Tirmidhi, the Prophet said in a sound narration, أَوْلَى nas bi يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ عَلَيَّ صَلَاةً The Prophet Wasallam said, those that will be closest to me and those that have the most right over me on the day of judgment are those that were most frequent in their uh, salat and salam, in their sending of salutations upon me. Uh, so we find that this act of worship um, is one that earns us closeness to the Prophet ﷺ. We uh, are living at a time and place where we are not physically connected to the Prophet ﷺ. We did not live uh, during his lifetime. We did not see him with our eyes or hear his voice with our ears. Uh, but that does not mean that we cannot have access and closeness to him in the akhirah. Some people, I remember one time we were talking about um, the stations of people on the Day of Judgment and somebody said, well, you know what? With all of the Sahaba and the companions and all of these righteous people that you hear about, I, I don't really stand a chance. So even, you know, uh, and this is not the right mindset to have, but you know, even if I am amongst those 
on the day of judgment that are spared and I go to Jannah, so I, I'm going to be very far. There's a lot of people better than me that are going to be closer to the Messenger of Allah. So that's actually not accurate. And that's not true. Uh, and that's not a good mindset to have. A believer should be hopeful. And a believer should be excited. And a believer should always be thinking about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a believer should not limit the realm of possibility in the afterlife based on what we know is possible in this dunya. So in this life, we are limited by certain constraints and certain rules. For example, if there's a big celebrity coming and there's like a million people going to see the celebrity and then you go, you're like, man, I'm not going to stand a chance. What are my chances of going and meeting this famous person? Slim to none. Because there's a million people that got there before you. But it doesn't work like that in the akhirah. In the hereafter, we are not in this dunya. There is, it's a different realm of existence. And the Prophet ﷺ is promising that those that will have closeness to him are those that make salat and salam often and regularly upon him. We find in another hadith, um, which we actually mentioned before, um, where the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يقعد قوم مقعدا إلا لا يذكرون الله عز وجل ويصلون على النبي إلا كان عليهم حسرة يوم القيامة. We talked about this in the last session that whenever a people gather and they sit down and they're chit chatting and they're talking about this and that and that and this and what not, and then that gathering ends and there is no mention of Allah in that gathering. And the Prophet said ولا يصل ويصل ويصلون على النبي. And also they did not. Send salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ. Then that gathering will be a source of regret and remorse. So if we look at the opposite of that, meaning if they did do salat and salam upon the Prophet, then that would be a praiseworthy gathering from them. Um, now in terms of sending salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ, we mentioned that it's something good to do uh, um, throughout our days and times. We mentioned uh, in previous sessions that it's good to do at the conclusion of our dua, at the conclusion of our conversation with Allah. Another time when it is highly encouraged is on the day of Friday, on Yawmul Jumu'ah. Where do we get that from? We get that from a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is actually recorded in the book of uh, Nasa'i, and the scholars have said it's authentic. The Prophet said, Inna min afdali ayyamikum Yawmul Jumu'ah. فيه خلق الله آدم وفيه قبض وفيه النفخ وفيه الصعقة فأكثروا علي من الصلاة فيه فإن صلاتكم معروضة عليه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the best of your days is the day of Jumu'ah, is the day of Friday. So Allah created seasons and days and weeks and months, and we have days of the week. Of the days of the week, the best day of the week is Friday, in terms of its value and its virtue. The Prophet mentions some things that happened on Friday. He says, this is the day that Adam was created. So Adam was created on a Friday. And actually also, it was also the day that he died and he returned back to Allah. His soul was taken on the day of Friday. Also, the day of Friday is the day when, uh, you know, the blowing will take place, which will basically end uh, existence and life of this dunya as a whole meaning this dunya will come to an end on the day of Friday the day of Friday is and then also the resurrection will also take place on the day of Friday so this dunya this world will cease to exist on the day of Friday and then resurrection again will take place on the day of Friday so Yom Al-Qiyamah will begin on a Friday so it is a virtuous day a lot of big events are going to take place on Friday so the Prophet says, فَأَكْثِرُوا So then, increase in your salat and salam upon me on that day. And then the Prophet said something very interesting. He said that your salutations will be delivered to me. They will be delivered and displayed and brought to me. They will be laid out in front of the Prophet wasallam Individually, so-and-so is sending salat and salam. So-and-so is sending salat and salam. So-and-so is doing that. So what do you think the Sahaba were wondering? What are you guys wondering? Hmm? But it, it begs a question, right? 
well, no, the other days as well. Not only on that day. He said increase on the day of Friday, but then the, the salat being delivered to him, that happens on any day. So the Sahaba said, how is that going to be after you have died? How does that work? So the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ أَن تَأْكُلَ أَجْسَادَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ The Prophet said that Allah has made it forbidden for the earth to eat from the bodies of the prophets and messengers. So usually when people die, their bodies decay. I mean, that's a natural process. Now there are some exceptions to that. Of the exceptions to that are the messengers and the prophets. Their bodies remain intact. And they are in that transitional state of existence. They are uh, receiving from the uh, angels messages. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, I receive from the angels delivered to me your salat and salam. I always remember this hadith when, you know, whenever we go for like hajj or umrah or something like that, or when I used to be in Medina, people would always say, uh, deliver my salam to the Prophet. And you go to, because when you go to Medina, you actually pass by where his grave is in the house of his wife, Aisha. Uh, where he is buried there and beside him Abu Bakr and Umar and so you go there and you say Assalamu alayka Ya Rasulullah you say you give salam to the messenger so people say you know just like if I was going to go meet someone that you know you would say oh give them my salam tell them I am giving them salam and so you go to them you say hey so and so says Assalamu alaikum so they want you to do that for the Prophet Sallallahu and that's really sweet you know that that's people say that because they really love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they wish they could be in Medina physically themselves doing that. But I always remember this hadith and I think, you know, um, if I was choosing, I would like to have the angels deliver my salam instead of me. Like if I wasn't me and I was talking to me, I'd be like, man, you're nothing compared to the angels. I'm going to have the angels deliver my salam. So I always think about that. So you can send salat and salam wherever you are on earth or on the sea, or in the sky, or wherever you might be, and you send salat and salam upon the messenger, and the angels will deliver it to him. So that is the conclusion of this chapter of dhikr. And as we mentioned in the beginning of this chapter, that we want to be amongst those that do dhikr kathira. Uh, that this is an act of worship that is very easy, and we are expected and commanded by Allah to do it in abundance. Something that you do a lot throughout your day and night. And Allah says in the Quran about you know, describing some of the believers that they are with ذَاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا with ذَاكِرَاتِ And so many of the scholars and the Sahaba were asked, how can I be considered from that category? So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said, Al-Murad, يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ فِي أَدْبَارِ الصَّلَوَاتِ وَغُدُوًّا وَعَشِيًّا وَفِي الْمَضَاجِعِ وَكُلَّمَا اسْتَيْقَضَ مِنْ نَوْمِهِ وَكُلَّمَا غَدَى أَوْ رَاحَ مِنْ مَنْزِلِهِ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى Ibn Abbas said this and it's recorded in the book of Imam Nawi of Al-Adhkar. He says, what's meant by those that do dhikr a lot. Do we want to be from that category of people? So this is what we have to do. He says, they do dhikr of Allah after every salah. After every prescribed, appointed act of worship that we do five times a day, after every salah we do dhikr. And he says, وَغُدُوًا وَعَشِيًّا And in the mornings and in the evenings. And وَفِي الْمَضَاجِرْ And even when we get into our beds, before you go to sleep. وَكُلَّمَ اسْتَيْقَضْ And then when you wake up from sleep. وَكُلَّمَ اسْتَيْقَضَ مِنْ نَوْمِهِ وَكُلَّمَ غَدَى أَوْ رَاحَ مِنْ مَنْزِلِهِ and each time you go, leave your house uh, and return, ذكر الله تعالى, they make dhikr of Allah. And each of these different events and movements has a prescribed dhikr, has a prescribed um, uh, uh, you know, statement or phrase that the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us to make. So it's important for us to learn those and get used to saying them. Uh, Mujahid, one of the early scholars, 
uh, one of the uh, students of the Sahaba, he says, لا يكون من الذاكرين الله تعالى كثيرا والذاكرات حتى يذكر الله تعالى قائما وقاعدا ومضطجعا He said, you will not be considered amongst the ranks of those that do dhikr kathiran a lot unless you are a person who makes dhikr when you're standing and when you are sitting and when you are laying down. And where does he get that from? He gets that from that verse in Surah Ali Imran. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ Allah says those that do dhikr of Allah when they are standing and when they are sitting and even when they are on their sides. Meaning laying down. Meaning in every station, every position you find yourself in, your tongue is remembering Allah, your heart is remembering Allah, your mind is thinking of Allah. Another great scholar, Ibn Salah was asked, how can I be considered amongst a dhakirin Allah kathiran with dhakirat, those that do dhikr a lot and in abundance. He said, إِذَا وَاضَبَ عَلَى الْأَذْكَارِ الْمَأْثُورَةِ الْمُثْبَتَةِ صَبَاحًا وَمَسَاءً وَفِي الْأَوْقَاتِ وَالْأَحْوَالِ الْمُخْتَلِفَةِ في ليل العبد ونهاره وهي مبنية في كتاب عمل اليوم والليلة كان من الذاكرين الله تبارك وتعالى كثيرا He says if you do dhikr and you wadaba عليه you are consistent upon it like it becomes a routine becomes part of your daily routine He says صباحا ومساء أذكار الصباح والمساء The collection of adhkar that we are taught specifically to make in the morning time and in the evening so after Fajr and before Maghrib. These are called Adhkar al-Sabah wal masa He says if you are consistent upon those authentic du'as that the Prophet taught us to make in the morning and the evening, then you will be uh, amongst al-Dhaqirin Allah kathiran wa dhaqirat. With that we conclude the third uh, form the third way of attaining the love of Allah and we move on to the fourth and the fourth is Imam Al-Qayyim says إثار محابه على محابك عند غلبات الهوى he says to do إثار which means to prefer to give preference to give preference to what Allah loves over what you love at those times when desires prevail. To give preference to what Allah loves over and above and before what you love at those moments when your desires are going to take over. Now this actually phrase, we find Ibn al-Qayyim himself explaining and expanding on it. He says, إثار رضا الله على رضا غيره To do إثار, to give preference to what Allah, what makes Allah happy over what makes you happy or anyone else. وَإِنْ عَظُمَتْ فِيهِ الْمِحَنْ And even if that means that you will go through a difficult test. وَثَقُلَتْ فِيهِ الْمُؤَنْ And the burden might get heavy. وَضَعُفَ عَنْهُ الطُّولْ وَالْبَدَنْ And even sometimes you might feel at a state of weakness that I can't do this, but you push through. Those are the moments when you are giving preference to what Allah loves and what Allah prefers. Let's uh, think about that for a minute and break it down. This word, إِثَار, actually we've spoken about it before. Um, I think maybe in, in a Jum'ah khutbah. But ithar is often translated as generosity in English. But in Arabic, ithar is a level within the scale of generosity. So Imam al-Ghazali says, Al-ithar a'la darajatul karam. Ithar is the highest level of generosity. So for example, they say to just be generous is for example to give someone something. So if I give you this water bottle, then you say, oh that's very nice, you're being very generous. Thank you. But ithar is if I was really thirsty, 
and I really want this water bottle, or this water, I mean, and I need it, but I put my needs and my desires aside, and I prefer yours. And I say, no, no, you know what? You need it more than me. Even if you don't. I might need it more than you, or I might want it more than you. But I give you preference. So I'm basically making an extra sacrifice, and, and, and I'm taking a hit. You know, they say, a person that's very wealthy, it's easy for them to do sadaqah. If a person is a millionaire, and they give a big sadaqah, no big deal. It hasn't impacted them. But imagine when a person that does not have very much is considered poor, and they give sadaqah. So somebody said, you know, for example, if you take as a fraction, right? So let's say a person is like a multimillionaire. And mashallah, they give half of their assets in sadaqah. They're still a millionaire. But imagine if a person is barely living paycheck to paycheck and they give half of their wealth to sadaqah. Allahu Akbar. Now they're like, Shh. Even though the fraction is the same, 50%, 50%. But who's going to feel it more? Right? So that's ithar. So there's generosity and then there's like super duper generosity of making a big sacrifice and taking a loss because you're preferring the needs of others. That's ithar. Exactly. So Allah describes actually the action of some of the sahaba and in general... Allah praises those that do ithar. Allah uses this word in the Quran. They have a need. They need it. Actually, some of the scholars say that this verse was revealed after a very interesting event that took place. Do um, you guys know about it? Anyone know what is said about Sabah bin Nuzul? The reason for revelation of this verse? We mentioned it in the Wednesday night class. If you guys were of those that attend the Wednesday night class, you would know it. La bas. It's okay, we'll forgive you. So the Prophet ﷺ received a guest. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he was in need. He was a traveler. He, was, he did not have his provisions. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ to host him. He said, can you take care of me? Can you give me something? So the Prophet sent to his wife. He said, do we have anything? And they said, Wallahi, we do not have anything. You know, before even continuing with the story, just to pause at that, that the household of the Prophet ﷺ had nothing to give. And that's Rasulullah ﷺ. Anyways, so then he sent to his other wives, the other households. هَلْ عِنْدَكُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ We don't have anything. All of his households were... had nothing to present, had nothing to give. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't stop there. He didn't tell the man, well, sorry, can't help you. See you later. Good luck. No. He didn't stop there. He said, well, you know, I can't help the guy, but let me be a source of finding help. So he called out to the Sahaba, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, who is going to take care of uh, my guest tonight? The Prophet took responsibility. This is my guest. I have nothing for him. Who can take care of my guest? So one of the Sahaba from the Ansar, he said, I'm going to take care of him tonight. Bismillah. And so he went home. The guy goes home and he tells his wife, I have the guest of Rasulullah. What do you have for us to feed him? She said, man. <laughs> well, she didn't say that. But she said, all we have is a little bit of food. And by the way, I was saving it for your little children. What are they going to do? The only food that's left is for the kids, the babies. So the man thought, he said, man, we got to do something. So what do you do? Because you know, those of you that have kids, if you don't feed them, what happens? There's a problem. So <laughs> he said, so the man told his wife, you know what? Uh, just keep the kids busy with something, distract them with something. And eventually we'll put them to sleep. You know, they will eat later, tomorrow, we'll keep them busy. But for now, we do what we can and we put them to sleep. Which is not easy, by the way. How easy is it to put a child to sleep when they haven't had food? 
It's not easy. They managed to put the kids to sleep. But he wasn't done. They had a really like full detailed plan. He said, okay, then whatever food you have, gather all of it and we will give it to our guest and he will sit in that corner of the house and we will turn on the light in the corner where he is on. The lantern, we will light it all the way where the guest is sitting, let him sit down and eat that food. You and I, we go sit in the other corner and we dim the light where we are sitting so it's dark. And by the way, when we're talking about house, we're not talking about, mashallah, you know, our houses. It was probably a room, yani, yani, uh, how can I even describe it? Yani, let's just say, you know, it, yeah, it was small, okay? You guys get the idea. So we sit in the other corner, we dim the light, and we pretend like we are eating. So you sit down here, turn on the light, here is all the food, you know, and husband and wife, we're going to sit over there, we're going to eat together. We don't, we don't want to bother you, just enjoy yourself. And they pretended like they were eating. Why? Because imagine if that guy knew that he's eating the last food that they have in that house, and even the kids went to sleep with nothing, and even these people are going to sleep with nothing. Do you think he would feel comfortable and he would eat? He'd be like, oh, that's okay. And he would go and he would still be hungry that night. They don't want that to happen. So it's not just about doing, feeding the guest, but it's also about making them feel comfortable. So they did that. The guest got their food, slept. They slept. They came the next morning and the man came to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ was smiling. So big. Big smile. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ told the man, he said, Allahu min fi'likuma. Or he said, uh, he said, Allah laughed at what you guys did last night. Allah was amazed at the action of you and your wife last night. That you made Allah so happy. You earned the pleasure and the happiness of Allah with what you did last night. Because you went above and beyond. Above and beyond. The basic expectations. And then the verse was revealed. You know, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا that these believers prefer others over themselves even though they are at a time of need. So that was, so do we understand what ithar means now? So he says, ithar mahabbihi ala mahabbika. Do ithar of what Allah loves over the things that you love. If there is a contradiction between the two. So you may love to do something that Allah also loves. Like let's say for example, Ramadan comes. Allah loves for you to be fasting. That's the best thing you could be doing in the day of Ramadan is fast. And you also are loving it and you're enjoying it. MashaAllah, excellent. But what if you come at a time in Ramadan, Allah loves for you to be fasting, and MashaAllah, you're loving to get you a nice lunch in the middle of the day. So at that point in time, we have a clash between what I love and what Allah loves. So if I do ithar of what Allah loves, I put that first. I say, you know what? Yes, I would love to do X, Y, and Z right now. But I'm going to put what Allah loves first. <coughs> then that is an, a, a means of attaining the love uh, of Allah. And then he talks about غلبات uh, hawa uh, To overcome desires. Now, by the way, before we get into that, they say that this... Uh, ithar of doing what Allah pleases ithar of, of what Allah pleases and what he loves this is the station of the anbiya and the messengers this is what the messengers this is the level that they were on they were always concerned about what is it that Allah loves and what is it that pleases Allah at this time hiya darajatul anbiya وَأَعْلَاهَا لِلرُّسُلِ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُهُ وَأَعْلَاهَا لِأُولِي الْعَزْمِ مِنْهُمْ وَأَعْلَاهَا لِنَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ This is the station that the Prophets and the Messengers were uh, in and the highest of them were the five that are known as Ulul Azm, the five messengers of determination and at the height of them all Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم So sometimes it's not about what I love but it could be about what others around me love. Or what society or what popular culture likes. So say for example, you know, there is something that is common in society or in culture around me. 
And it's not something beloved to Allah. And if I were to ignore what everybody else is loving, I'll be the weirdo. I'll be the weirdo. And we experience that every single day. If you want to live as an upright Muslim in today's day and age, in so many different instances, you are going opposite of the current of popular culture. Because it's not popular, it's not fashionable, it's not attractive nowadays to be a modest, God-fearing person. That's considered backwards. That's considered um, unintellectual. That's considered not living your life to the fullest. Right? We hear all of these different types of phrases. Right? And that only increases as we get closer to the Day of Judgment. That fitna gets more intense. So if you're going against that current, you are preferring what Allah loves over what society and what popular culture is telling me to do. And that is part of earning the love of Allah on this station. And at the height of that is the Anbiya, the Prophets and Messengers. So, theology, when the Prophet ﷺ is coming to the people and saying to them, worship Allah alone, that was not an attractive message for the people at that time. It's going against the grain. And it's also not financially lucrative. Because if you worship Allah alone, all of these idols and statues are going to go and they're making money off of them. And people are coming to make pilgrimage to visit this collection of idols. Well, no one's going to do that anymore, so there's a problem. So it was not theologically attractive. It was not what was popular or common. It, what it didn't make to them financial sense. So they were not happy with the message with the theology that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was bringing to the people. So the Prophet ﷺ is majorly had to go against the grain in that early Meccan society. And did he? Yes, he did indeed. How, what was the population of Muslims in the Meccan phase of the Seerah in the first 13 years after revelation? They were very few. They were the minority. It wasn't until post-migration when the Muslims were able to establish their own community and their own society, that Islam then flourished and grew, and then eventually they became the majority in the area. But before then, it was not attractive. It, didn't, it wasn't good. Or at least people didn't think so. Had they trusted Allah and His Messenger, they would have found the benefits of that. And those that did believe did find those benefits. So we find the Prophet ﷺ going against what everyone Loves. You know, they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and they would say, we will make you the wealthiest and richest amongst us. We will give you the most attractive spouses that we have. We will make you our king. You'll be our medic. And Quraysh at that time did not have a king. We'll make you a king. We'll make a new kingship. Don't worry, we'll make it just for you. Right? Even they tried to bargain with him. Okay, one year we worship your Lord, the next year you worship ours. Like give and take, you know, like work with us here a little bit, you know. No. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ well, The Prophet ﷺ did not make any of those compromises in his tawheed, in his theology. Is that doing ithar of what Allah loves? Big time. So that's the work of the Prophets. So when we find ourselves in a situation where it's not common, and it's not you know, uh, attractive, and, and it's not something pushed in popular culture, know that you are in the station of the Anbiya. You are in the same struggle and in the same you know, um, battlefield that the prophets were in of going against the grain. Why? Because this is something far greater purpose-driven. Seeking the pleasure of Allah rather than seeking the pleasure of others. Sometimes people will make a statement of, uh, you know, a, a statement that is a lie or they will cover up the truth or they will defend oppression. Why? Because that's what will make other people like me. But we're not in the business of getting other people to like us. We should be in the business of, of making sure Allah is happy with us. That is doing ithar of muhabbatillah, ithar of what Allah loves. And then he talks about ghalabatul hawa, to go against your desires. Hawa is literally those, those things that we desire, the things that we like. Now, if Again, just like you said, if it's something I like that Allah also likes, no problem. Good. If it's something that I desire and it's not impermissible, it's mubah, it's permissible, it's acceptable, no problem. 
But the problem arises when I desire something, I have certain desires, and they are not permissible. This is not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Or it's something Allah forbade. It could be something haram. So what am I going to do at that point? Am I going to fight my desires or am I going to allow them to supersede? Uh, Imam Nutaymiyyah, he says in a quote, يَحْتَاجُ الْمُسْلِمُ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَخَافَ اللَّهِ وَيَنْهِ النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He says a person has to be afraid of Allah, have fear of Allah, and fight and command and forbid your own self. You know, it's funny when you hear some of these quotes of the Sahaba like Umar, there are many quotes of Umar radiallahu anhu where he is talking to himself. He's talking to his own self. And he's talking to, like as if it's another person standing in front of him. But it's not. He's talking to himself. Don't do this. You can't do this. They were tough with themselves. They held themselves to high standards. Um, that's why the Prophet sallallahu says in authentic hadith, which is recorded in the book of at tirmidhi and the scholar said it is sound, the Prophet said, Al-Mujahidu man jahada nafsahu fi Allahi azza wa jal. The Prophet ﷺ says, A mujahid, someone who does jihad. Oh, is that like not a popular word? We're not supposed to say that anymore? No, we can say it, inshallah. Don't be afraid. He said, A person who does jihad is the one who does jihad against himself for the sake of Allah. Before you want to talk about doing jihad against anyone else or any other entities, you can do jihad against yourself, meaning your desires. When your nafs, when your soul desires to do something, and it's not permissible, it's not pleasing to Allah. So you got to fight. You have to bite down. That is an internal battle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Nazi'at, فَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَى النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nazi'at verses 38 to 41 As for the one who transgresses طَغَى Transgress, goes beyond the limits وَآثَرَ Does this word sound familiar? إِثَار آثَرَ This is the verb form They're doing إِثَار of الحيات الدنيا they are giving preference to this worldly life. Over what? Over the hereafter. So what's the reward for them? Allah says, so the person, they transgress, they go too far, they go beyond the limits, the limits that Allah set for us, and they prefer this worldly life over the hereafter. What's the result? Allah says, فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Then, the hellfire is where they will end up finding themselves. That's ma'wa. that's where they will end up. But there's another alternative as well. There's another option. Allah says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَ النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى Allah says, but how about for the case of the person that always reflects over the station of their Lord? Meaning the fact that my Lord is the one that gave me certain obligations and certain prohibitions and therefore my own good. They always reflect upon that. Allah is the one in charge. He tells me what to do and what not to do. Whether I desire or not. So they reflect over that. مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَّهَ النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ And they forbid their own nafs, their own souls from engaging in it, those desires that are impermissible. Allah says, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ Then Jannah, paradise, will be where they end up. That will be where they are led to. وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ Imam Al-Alusi, scholar of Tafsir, he says in his Tafsir book, أَيْ زَجَرَهَا وَكَفَّهَا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ وَهُوَ الْمَيْلِ إِلَى الشَّهَوَاتِ وَضَبَطَهَا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالتَّوْطِينِ عَلَىٰ إِثَارِ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَلَمْ يَعْتَدْ بِمَتَاعِ الدُّنْيَا وَزَهْرَتِهَا وَلَمْ يَغْتَرْ بِزَغَارِفِهَا وَزِينَتِه so he says, what does it mean to do to forbid your nafs from desires? It means to criticize your nafs. To hold your nafs accountable. Self-critique. We, 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 lo- we always are very, um, we're really good actually, mashallah. We're good at like critique of others. 
But the successful person is the one who's really good at self critique, hold themselves accountable. Um, and he says, Al Hawa here is Al Mail ila Shahawat, to lean towards those things that are desired. And the human being is created with Shahawat. That's what that makes a human human. They have certain desires, physical desires. That's part of being a human being. If you didn't have that, we would, you know, we would start thinking maybe this is like some artificial intelligence or something like that. That's what makes a human being a human being. That's why it is said in the famous quote, I think we've mentioned this before, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created angels in a certain um, realm of existence, that they don't have these desires that the human beings have. And Allah created animals and they don't have the intellectual capacity that the human being has been gifted with but they have to I mean what do animals do they wake up they search for food they eat that food they search for a mate they procreate then they have to release the food that they ate azakumullah may Allah honor you then they go back to sleep in the process of which they may fight with one another to compete for food or a mate or territory and then they will die. Now of course the animals are doing tasbih, they are glorifying Allah in their own way, but the process of their life consists of basic physical desires, food, uh, procreation, and sleep. That's what most of the animals do. I mean they engage in other activities, it's very beautiful, amazing to watch that. There is a sign of the perfection of the creation of Allah, but that's what they were created to do. They're not straying from their purpose. Then the quote continues, and this is attributed to one of the Sahaba, uh, that Allah created the human being as in a balance between the two. Like the angels with that high intellectual capacity, but also like the animals with physical desires and needs. But the idea is which one of the two will supersede. So it is said, فَإِذَا غَلَبَ عَقْلُهُ عَلَى شَهْوَتِهِ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَإِذَا غَلَبَتْ شَهْوَتُهُ عَلَى عَقْلِهِ فَهُوَ دُونَ الدَّوَابِ So the person whose intellect takes precedence over their physical desires, then they have the potential to reach a station even higher than the angels, with the exception of Jibreel. But the general population of the angels, a believer can be at a higher status than the angels. If they are using their intellectual gift to control their physical desires and only fulfill them in that which is halal. But if the opposite happens, if the desires take precedence over our aql and our intellect, uh, then we actually drop to a status lower than the animals. Because the animals, as we said, are doing what they were created to do. But this is not what the human being was created to do. We were not created to wake up and sleep and procreate and then poop and then go back to sleep again. That's No. We are created for a higher and loftier purpose of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of seeking that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of bringing benefit to the creation around us. So if we don't fulfill that purpose, then we fall to a station lower than even the animals. Um, what time is Isha? Nine o'clock? It's saying 9.04 right now. So I guess we will stop here. The next section is actually really, really cool. It's a, a list by the scholar Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah. Ibn al-Jawzi, um, he compiled a list of seven steps. Is it seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. Seven steps to fight your hawa, to combat, to do jihad against your hawa, and to win. And to win in that battle. To win against your own desires. And so uh, we will carry on from there, inshallah ta'ala, next week, bi idnillah. Any questions? Yeah, we started the fourth. We began the fourth, so we will continue the fourth, inshallah. Preferring that which Allah loves over uh, what we love. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. It's very good. It's very good and it's, it's the key to success. If a person gives in to every, every desire that they have, they give in to it, then that's 
uh, uh, that is weakness. And that's why true strength is inner strength. And true strength is being able to overcome your hawa. Overcome those desires. Now there are certain desires that Allah created with, uh, uh, within us. And Allah gave us a halal, actually every desire. Every desire at the root of it, there is a way to manifest it, to fulfill it in that which is halal. And there is a way to fulfill it in that which is haram. So the human being desires to be wealthy. The human being wants to be rich. This is what most people, somebody might say, come, you know what, I don't want to. But you say, Jazakallah khair, thank you very much, Allah bless you. But you're not like most people. Most people want to have wealth. And it doesn't only have to be in the form of money, but it could be in property, could be in achievements, it could be in family, size of family, you know. This is something, an age old thing that people used to brag about. Look how big my tribe is, look how big my family is. People brag about that, until now they still do. You'd think with all the technology, people are still bragging about the same things. Uh, so this is a desire, a human desire. So, is the desire in and of itself bad? No. But how you are going to fulfill it? So somebody might say, you know what, I want to be rich. Tell them, okay, how are you gonna, what are you going to do? They say, you know what, they have, mashallah, 10 different financial endeavors. And all of them involve... Riba. And by the way, you can really make a lot of money off of riba. Interest, usury. It's not too hard. It's not hard at all. It's pretty easy. There's a lot of ways you can do that. And you will find institutions encouraging it. It's very smart. <laughs> I was, uh, not too long ago, my wife and I were looking for, I'm actually delaying because somebody sent me a message and said, Friday's Isha is later. Is this correct? That's why I'm taking my time. So we'll go for a few more minutes. My wife and I were looking for a place to rent, to move to. And so we, we saw this place and the realtor is showing us the place. So, um, so the real estate agent said, you know, we were talking and talking. He said, why don't you buy a house? He said, uh, no, I'm not interested right now. Thank you very much. He said, why not? You know, I guess the real estate agent wants to make a sale. I guess she had some houses that she wants to sell and she thought we were good candidates. So we said, well, maybe, we'll see in the future, maybe, Allahu A'lam, who knows. But right now, uh, that's not on the plan. Why, why, why? You know, she, I said, you know, oh, khalas, you want the lecture? I'll give you the lecture. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala rasulullah. Well, actually, we're not going to buy a house because, ex you know, she's asking for it, so I gave it to her. So I told her everything about riba. You know, right now, we're in a situation, if I want to buy a house, I can buy a house tomorrow, but it's going to involve riba. I'm not interested in that. And so I said, wow. How do you know about that? So, yeah, now you know. So they're amazed. Now she's saying she's amazed, but you can tell from the look on her face, like, what a bunch of idiots, you know? <laughs> you can be saving so much money. Um, so that's fine. I mean, in, in, in their estimation, they think, but that's fighting against Hawa, and that's fighting against the Hawa of the culture around. Everybody's saying, go do this, you know? And not just one house, buy a few. And then rent them out and mashallah and buy and sell and flip and amazing, you can make a lot of money, mashallah. But you don't. So that's a human desire. But if you fulfill it in something that is haram, you know, that's not that's not um, that's not appropriate. Uh, definitely. That struggle, that struggle, that process, each it, it's it's a big war. And each little battle brings more contentment to your heart and more peace into your life and brings you closer to your Creator. And all you have to do is ask people who have gone through that for a long time. Salil Mujarrad. Ask those who have tried. You know, so... Uh, so fighting the hawa, fighting the desires is very good to answer your question. Any other questions? Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who love him and of those whom he loves. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Allahumma inna nas'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbuk 
We ask you, O Allah, for your love and for the love of those whom you love and for the love of actions and deeds that bring us closer to you, O Allah. You are the most generous. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the best of whatever the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for. And we ask Allah to protect us from all the evil that the Prophet sought protection in Allah from. نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعادك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونسألك الجنة ونعيمها We ask you, O Allah, for Jannah and its pleasures ونعوذ بك من النار And we seek refuge in you, O Allah, from the hellfire ربنا أتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقينا عذاب النار We ask you, O Allah, for the best of this life and the best of the hereafter and we ask protection from the torment of the hellfire سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك We glorify you, O oh Allah, how perfect you are and free from any fault. We bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except you. We seek your forgiveness, we repent, and ask you to forgive us, and we return back to you. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والله أعلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.